and it is my pleasure now to introduce JD, who has been an uh, out gay leader since 2007. He has over 30 years of experience as a uh, communication leadership expert. He is a much beloved lecturer uh, at the GSB who had co-founded the course um, Low Keynotes, which uh, allows students to learn how to give um, a talk on purpose to their peers. Um, he also just recently came out with his first book called Communication Mastery um, in 2020 in May, I believe it came out. Um, and he is a JD Key Faculty Award winner for his service to GSB alumni. He's always been a great supporter of uh, our alumni program. So it's always um, such a, a great honor to have him participate here with us. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to JD. Thank you so much, Allegria. And uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are at. Uh, I'm excited to have the next hour with you to share some of the research and writing I've been doing about communication strategies for LGBTQ leaders and their allies. And uh, I love just from some of the people I know on, on the uh, screen here, uh, I know that we've got some members of the LGBTQ community. We've got uh, some allies, we've got uh, some parents, we've got some educators. Uh, and, uh, and it's a great mix. And so I look forward to the conversation. Uh, I will, uh, I've got a few slides, of course, you know, I'm a GSB lecturer. We, we don't go anywhere without a slide deck and uh, a few frameworks that I'll share with you. I, um, where I decided I want to start, and I'm not going to put my slides quite up yet, but I will in a moment here, uh, is, is just I appreciated the, the bio that Allegria gave me, the intro, but I thought I might share just a little bit about my journey to and then beyond uh, Stanford's GSB. Um, when I started at Stanford in the uh, June of 2007, uh, when I was in the interview process that spring, I remember asking David Kreps, you know, uh, after the offer had been made, I said, you know, is there another gay or lesbian faculty member that I could speak to as Ken and I decide, you know, whether to accept this offer? I'd, I'd love to know a little bit about the culture for, for, you know, the gay community on campus. Dead silence on the other end of the phone. You don't make David Kreps speechless very often. And he stammered a little bit and he said, uh, I, I know we have some on campus. I can't think of anybody at the business school right now. And that was a little bit of a red flag for me. I mean, I was coming from NYU where I'd been out. I'd worked with Reaching Out. I'd worked with Out for Undergrad. And I wasn't sure this was the, the best step for me professionally and personally. And I had just proposed to my husband four days before my final interview at Stanford. But I did talk to some students and I did do some research and I decided this was an awesome career move, which it has been for the last 13 years. Um, but when I came, I found out I was the first out gay faculty member at the GSB. Now, there was, <laughs> there was a lesbian, but she had retired right when I came. So it was kind of like, you know, there was a quota. We could have one of the letters, an L, a G, a B, or a T, but, but not two at the same time. Uh, uh, Marianne, uh, um, slipping her last name right now, but uh, she and I have become good friends since I arrived. Uh, we have, I think the last time I counted, more than a dozen of us who are in the uh, LGBTQ community on faculty, including uh, two people who are in the, in the uh, tenure line. Uh, I've been a part of the journey of some staff members who have uh, 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 gone through uh, the um, uh, move from uh, uh, female to male and male to female and have been extremely well supportive as transgender individuals on, on faculty or on staff. And, uh, and I think the, the climate has just gotten better and better at the GSB uh, over that period of time to the point where now, you know, we consider diversity both in applicants as well as guest speakers, as well as in uh, uh, cases that we teach to include not just having more women protagonists, but including LGBTQ in, in our efforts towards diversity. 
So uh, let's jump in. Uh, Marianne Huckabee. Thank you, Leslie. That was that was the name I was struggling for her last name. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so this is uh, this is my gay agenda. Um, it's out there. I, I'm admitting it. Uh, I'm going to give you two quick frameworks, um, one that I've borrowed and uh, one that I have uh, uh, created myself. And then I'm going to use a little bit of video of some of our students uh, uh, from the low keynotes program that Allegria mentioned and uh, and then talk about some resources you can use both as out leaders in your organization or as allies uh, in your organization. So uh, let's move to, um, let me just open with this question. And you can either, we're a small enough group, you can either unmute and answer, or you can, um, uh, or you can answer in the chat box. Um, but what, what does it mean to you to be marginalized? And can you think of a time where you have experienced being marginalized. You can either unmute and answer or drop a, a thought in the discussion box. What's marginalized and when have you felt it? This is the audience participation part of our show where if you want to join in, you're welcome to. Uh, I like that, to be considered less than the norm of the group. Thanks, Scott. Anybody else, either a, a definition or an experience? Being the only LGBT individual at both law firms uh, where you've worked, being discounted, yeah, being moved to the margin, having your opinion not embraced or not, uh, not taken into account. I certainly, in the opening story that I shared, um, was fearful of being marginalized because of my uh, identity as an out gay man. Um, it's funny, sometimes people say, as an LGBTQ, I'm like, I'm, I'm just a G, but you know, I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. Um, being excluded, patronized, singled out, uh, have aspects of me uh, to be diminished or overlooked. What's interesting about, thanks for those definitions, everyone. What's interesting about the question of marginalization is all of us have had that experience. It may be because of our sexual orientation, because of our gender expression, because of our gender, because of our politics, because of our faith, because of our status as a parent, because our status as a single person. Um, and so whether you are a member of the community or an ally of the community, all of us have had that experience of being discounted for some reason. And so as we think of how do I communicate most effectively when I'm experiencing being excluded, condescended, overlooked, discounted, marginalized? I believe if you have that mindset on, you will be able to use the strategies that we're going to talk about here. Now, the first place that I always like to begin from is this beautiful slide in front of you now blank white page. I believe that the canvas on which we paint our reputation, our expression, our communication, our leadership style, that canvas needs to be a canvas of authenticity. So I don't want the, the executives who come to our LGBTQ exec ed program uh, the, the students in GSB Pride that I coach and mentor on their communication style, their interviewing, their talks. I don't want to create cookie cutters of everybody needs to look the same way, needs to express the same way. No, not at all. In fact, I think the thing we need to do the most is be our most authentic selves in our interactions with other people. Now, Authentic, <laughs> what um, uh, uh, Joel Peterson used to say, uh, the most important thing for a leader is authenticity. If you don't have authenticity, fake it until you have it. Um, authenticity is, is one of those qualities that we know in our heart if we are being our full self, bringing our full self or not. 
It's not that I have to be completely transparent. There are settings where I choose not to talk about my three children and, and, and the uh, four different races that are expressed in my family uh, or, or that exist in my family. There are times that I may choose not to talk about. I grew up in the Midwest, that I uh, have an undergraduate degree from a small state college that nobody's heard of. Um, but it's not that I'm hiding. I just want to choose what is my most authentic self in this moment. And that level of authenticity has to be the canvas on which we start from. Now, with that in mind, uh, I want to start with a video from the Low Keynote Library. Now, uh, you'll get a link to the entire Low Keynote Library, which at this point I think is almost 250 talks. I think it's somewhere north of 3 million views. If you haven't seen any of these, these are nine to 10 minute talks that GSB students do, uh, completely extracurricular, on how they wanna move forth to change lives, change organizations, and change the world. And it's a program I started uh, in 2012 at the GSB, and it's not limited to LGBT students, but I have had a number of our students in the community deliver talks, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a list of those. You could just you know, go straight to those talks if you wanted. There was one this year uh, from a young man, Shawan Jackson, who I did not coach. Um, I, I wasn't a, a part, an active part of the program this year because of my administrative responsibilities at Stanford, but his talk changed me. And so I'm going to show you just an ex excerpt of Shawan Jackson's talk, because I think it captures the authenticity uh, that we have been talking about. On the one hand, this makes complete sense. Our world favors those who just fit in. And as important as authenticity is, it comes with a risk of being judged, of being ignored, of being silenced. And this is a risk that many people care about, not just people of color. According to a 2014 inclusion report from Deloitte, 83% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in the US said they are not fully themselves at work. 66% of women said the same, and so did 44% of straight white men. Many of us feel this pressure to conform, to avoid the risk of exclusion. But conformity comes with a cost. Every time we change how we present, from the words we use to our tone to our presentation, we validate a status quo that does not equally appreciate multiple forms of presentation. We send a message to younger generations that you can be heard so long as you sound, look, and dress more or less like everyone else. The easy answer would be, well, don't conform when you communicate. But it's not that straightforward because at times you do need to accommodate your audience so that you can make your perspective heard. I don't know the answer to, to this question of how to deal with that. On the one hand, I do want to be authentic. On the other hand, I want to be heard. Even as I'm standing in front of you right now, I'm wondering if the way I'm dressed and the way I'm presenting is really me or just what I think you want me to be. And if I can't answer that question for myself, who am I to talk to my students about it? Shuan's talk uh, really painting that tension between wanting to be authentic and wanting to be heard. As a young man, he was a national champion uh, high school debater, and, and he recognized that he very quickly learned how to conform in a way that he could win and be heard and be recognized but as he said in that short excerpt that we saw, conformity comes with a price. And he recognized that he was trying to speak in a way that was less black, less gay, less out there so that he could be heard. And yet it, it, it cost him his authenticity. And his talk really rocked my world when I saw it. It was actually the last day at the GSB before we went into uh, shelter in place. And it was one of the last public events that we had. Uh, it was on uh, first Friday in March. And by 
uh, the Monday following, um, we were doing everything via Zoom. I encourage you after this to watch his entire talk, but I wanted to start with it because he really paints that tension that we stand in and conformity is not one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do, but to be aware of when your conformity may be getting in the way of your authenticity. Now, a few of you have seen uh, my work in the, um, in the LGBTQ exec ed program, and I occasionally I've done this uh, for GSB students. What I have developed over the last five years of, of research and working primarily with executives over the last uh, four or five years, I've developed what I consider the LGBTQ leadership presence radar. And these four elements, clarity, confidence, competence, and connection, those are the four C's that I'm gonna urge you on a canvas of authenticity to exercise and build your uh, skills inside of. Uh, now, the way this radar works is you ultimately want to have as big of a footprint as you can. <laughs> I like to call it the lavender diamond. And so the, the stronger that you can uh, express clarity, confidence, competence, and connection, the greater your presence will be as a leader in the community. And for our allies on the phone, I think all of this applies to any of us who are marginalized, but it may particularly be helpful for you as you're coaching members of your team, members of your family, or students that you work with, who are from a marginalized community. So let's look at each of these individually. First of all, uh, let's start with the concept of clarity. And I'm gonna go to the master, as far as I know, he's not a part of the LGBTQ community, but Albert Einstein, early in his career, said this. He, he called those of us who use PowerPoint and, and de design ugly, ugly, complex slides, he called us uh, violent, and I certainly have experienced uh, death by PowerPoint. Um, but later in his career, he said it even more clearly. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. When we look at clarity as a leader, it's not that you are dumbing down your message to the lowest common denominator, but you're being sure that your message is so clear, there's not ambiguity around it, that people understand what you're speaking about, what you're encouraging, and how they need to step up or step forward based on the information that you're sharing with them. Hands down, this is, and the reason I put it first, hands down, this is one of the greatest skills of a communicator and leader, is being sure that your message is clear, J.D., I think we lost your sound. And easily understood. I lost my sound. You're back uh, now. My interconnection. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, what I was saying is at Stanford, with all of the communications that have happened in COVID-19, we haven't always had a sense of clarity from our senior leader, uh, the president of the university, because he's been so comprehensive. One of my colleagues took his three-page email and narrowed it down to one page and it was much easier to read and much more clear. So focusing on clarity. Now I'm going to give you an example of this again and this time I'm going to go to the TED library and in the TED library uh, I want to uh, share with you all a talk by uh, Francis Fry. Francis is an out lesbian uh, faculty member at the um, uh, at uh, business school at Harvard, and uh, she was the first speaker from the TED stage that I ever saw that, that did something really incredibly, incredibly bold. And uh, what she did is she used a chalkboard in her TED talk. So let me give you uh, Frances Fry from the TED stage. And we're just gonna watch a little bit of her talk 
where she talks about both authenticity and clarity. The key to us creating greater excellence, excellence than we've ever known is possible. I love the way that Frances expresses it, that she hopes at some point in your life, you have the beautiful luxury of representing difference. But with that luxury comes a responsibility to not hold back. There is not, as, as the slide said a moment ago, there is not a one single approach to this, but there is a North Star of being your authentic self and then approaching that with clarity, confidence, competence, and connection. I loved her triangle of get your point up there first. It's how I teach people to write emails, certainly how I teach people to make reports in meetings. And I think that is, uh, that is a great um, image uh, to hold on to. Second, let's talk about confidence. Now, uh, I love the work of Amy Cuddy, who has one of the most TED, watched TED Talks that's out there, and her discussion of uh, what it takes to be present. This is an excerpt from her book, Presence Isn't About Pretending to Be Competent. It's about believing in and revealing the abilities you truly have. It's about shedding whatever's blocking you from expressing who you are. It's about tricking yourself into accepting that you are indeed capable. Sometimes we have to get out of the way of ourselves so that we can be ourselves. Uh, I work with a personal coach, uh, executive coach that Stanford pro provides for me, Ben Kiker, and he talks about, I've got to silence that itty bitty shitty committee, that that voice inside that says, you can't do this, you're not good enough. The internalized homophobia that I have grown up with and the internalized marginalization that many of you may have experienced, we have to silence and let go of so that we can be truly confident in what we express. Now, because this is a communication workshop, if you struggle with anxiety in public speaking, then I encourage you, I implore you, check out Matt Abraham's book. Uh, I thought I had it on my bookshelf. Um, freaking Up, <laughs> Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. Uh, Matt is a uh, fellow lecturer at the GSB. Uh, I brought him on just a year or two after I came, and he's got some great videos and great resources on how to overcome situation anxiety, audience anxiety, and goal-based anxiety. So I encourage you to, uh, to check that out to build your sense of confidence. Third in the lavender diamond is competence. Uh, the best way for you to be respected as a leader or ally in the LGBTQ community is to be sure that you have the skills and abilities to do the job that you have been asked to do. And that will be different for all of us, depending on, on the field that we are in. Uh, I know we've got some people on, on the line uh, who have been involved in politics and who've been elected officials and have worked to get other people elected. Um, if you can't be competent, do the work that you're expected to do as a citizen legislature or as a chief of staff or as uh, uh, you know, somebody who's representing a constituency, the other three C's don't really matter because we need people in office who have the competence to do the work that they have been asked to do. And for all of us, that will be different. Uh, I just stepped into a year ago, stepped into a leadership role at the university, it was the first time I had had a leadership role over a large number, or for me, a larger staff than I'd ever had before. And I made some missteps and my competence as a leader got challenged and I needed to shore that up before I worked on any of the other three C's uh, on the diamond. One vivid example of this, and it's a story that I tell uh, in my book, which you will hear about later, uh, Communicate with Mastery. Um, I was at a, uh, uh, spoke at a um, victory fund 
event in December of 2016. Now, this is about four weeks after our current president had been elected, but before his inauguration. And there was a panel of six of the out gay ambassadors. They were all uh, gay white men. Um, but that was uh, the portrait of people who had been named ambassadors. And they spoke knowing that on inauguration day, they would all, as is the case in the State Department, submit their resignation. And uh, two of them, uh, um, Ted Osius, who was uh, ambassador to Vietnam, and James Brewster, who was ambassador to Dom the Dominican Republic, both working inside of countries that are not particularly gay friendly and welcoming, um, uh, particularly because of the faith communities in those two countries. And they were both appointed on the same day and they were waiting to come. Uh, they had passed their congressional hearing. They were waiting to be um, uh, sworn in and they were in the green room and they relayed this conversation where um, uh, Brewster told Osius, whatever we do, we better do our jobs really, really well. All eyes will be on us. They knew going in as the first out gay leader that the scrutiny was going to be even higher than any of their predecessors. If you are the first black person, if you're the first women, woman, if you're the first transgender leader, if you are the first gay faculty member, there will be scrutiny on you and you've got to be sure you do the job you're assigned to do really, really, really well. Fourth is connection. Now this is the one I love to teach the most because the best way to teach connection is uh, to get people to be more effective with two, uh, two tools that are a lot of fun to work on. Uh, storytelling and humor. And uh, for this, I am going to, where are we at? Ah, perfect shape on time. I'm gonna open up for questions in just a minute. But I've got one final video clip that I want to share with you. And for this, I'm gonna go to the TEDx library uh, to look at LB Hanna's TEDx talk. Um, as you watch LB share his experiences, uh, pay attention to his ability to tell stories and pay attention to his ability to use humor effectively. I'm a dad and I even have the dad jokes to prove it. Uh, I, I really enjoy LB's uh, use of storytelling the details, the Cheerios, the coffee, the drive-through, uh, and uh, the sense of humor by taking a subject that those of us who have not transitioned uh, don't know well, uh, LB makes it accessible by uh, his commitment to uh, being um, humorous, connected, and using stories as a way of access. At this point, uh, right where I wanted to be at a quarter to 10 on the uh, east, west coast, wherever I am this morning, I actually was up this morning ready to start this at eight o'clock and I, I realized that an hour, so I got to take my kids to daycare. So I wanna remind you that the lavender diamond is aspirational. Very rarely will you hit 50, 50, 50 all the way across and have that perfect score. You may be new in an organization and you may have to over index on connection because you don't yet have competence. Or you may be in a situation where you don't have the confidence you need, but you do want to be sure you have the competence. And so you make up for it in preparation for the meeting. Or you may take more time in writing an email or preparing notes for a talk so that clarity is unquestioned while connection is not yet where you want it to be. And so it's a fluid diagram. And uh, what I hope to go to next in my research is to actually build some tools that we could assess and see uh, where people are and, and how to build uh, where they are weaker in the diagram. I believe strongly that communication is the same thing as leadership and leadership is the same thing as communication. 
when I'm brought into an organization to work with somebody who's having leadership trouble, they're usually having communication trouble. And when I'm brought into an organization to work with somebody who's not communicating well, they're usually not leading well. The two are so powerfully intertwined with each other. And that's why I believe that communication is not something you can ever perfect. If you can remember way back in time to high school geometry, the concept of an asymptote is a straight line with a curve that gets closer and closer and closer, but never crosses that line. That concept of an asymptote is the way I see mastery and ability. You get better and better and better, but you never, there is no such thing as a perfect email or a perfect talk or a perfect webinar or a perfect call because we can always get incrementally better and better at what we're doing. And so with that concept, uh, that is uh, why I created uh, the, um, the book that I encourage you to check out. Uh, communicate with mastery. Um, we will in the uh, this isn't a, a, a an infomercial, um, but even just to check out the excerpts that are online, I do think it is a, a useful tool. And for those of you that I didn't have the privilege of teaching at the GSB, uh, it gives you a good feel for what is now being taught in strategic communication. In the resource list that we send you afterwards, I'll, con I'll include links. These are a handful of low keynote talks by uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, and bisexual students at the GSB and actually even one by uh, the child of a lesbian couple. Um, and these are the resources that I encourage you to check out. Um, uh, I think anything Nancy Duarte wrote is great, but Illuminate is a wonderful uh, resource for leaders on how to use speeches, stories, symbols, and ceremonies. Presence, uh, the book I noted earlier by Amy Cuddy. There's some questions about her research and the replicability of it. I believe in it because it, it works for me and my students. And then if you're really struggling with public speaking, uh, the credibility code. And finally, uh, my own book, which I've talked enough about, but I will close by leaving uh, my contact information if you have further questions, I'm glad to stay on the line here, but also feel free to uh, reach out to me. Uh, there's all of my contact deets. And uh, thanks for spending an hour with me this morning. Excellent. Thank you all and have an awesome, awesome Thursday.